My name is Dave Winslow. Uh, I'm the, the head coach uh, at Lee Summit West High School, or I should say I was. Um, I stepped down this year, so especially this nugget that I want to give you at the end, I can't take it with me, so I want to be able to give it to somebody else. Um, so uh, I've been coaching for eight years as a head coach. I've been in, kind of helping out doing assistant coaching for a total of 10. Um, all right, wait a minute. That's, that's all the way to the end. Don't look. Spoilers. Okay. Um, I'm going to present these, mistake, these common shooter mistakes in relation to the 11 steps. It's just easy as a coach to, to organize it that way. Um, it's easy for you to remember and recognize, and it's easier for you to coach that way. Uh, when I very first started uh, the NASP as coaching, you know, I, I seen that, that little poster that was up there, it was hanging on the net. I was like, that's kind of cool. You know, it's hanging in the elementary school. It, uh, you know, and I was kind of helping out. I was like, that's great for these elementary kids. They don't know what the next thing to do is. And I kind of thought, uh, uh, you know, that's just a little, that's little baby steps for the little kids. Um, and I was, I was horribly wrong. I started coaching high school for the first two years of high school. I didn't even have one of those posters. Partially because we had no money, and I didn't want to spend the $20 or whatever it was to buy one because I was mo buying most everything out of my own pocket. So we didn't have one of those, and that was probably the biggest mistake that I made as a coach. Um, so number one, calming coaching mistakes, not sh shooter mistakes. Um, you need to have that. You need to, you need to organize your entire archery instruction you know, around that 11 step, and it needs to be present all the time, especially at the beginning of practice for warm-ups. It's, it's very critical. It's not just an accidental thing that NAFS started, started doing. Um, if they go to any other discipline, if they go to USA Archery or, or, or shoot in another discipline, they have a set of steps that just, just almost mirrors this perfectly. So um, that's probably where, you know, when I got USA certified, it's like, well, wait a minute. Maybe those steps that NAFS wanted us to use really were a good thing. So um, if, if, if I were to define the NASP program as having 10 pillars, I would consider the 11 steps being one of those big pillars. You know, it's very, very important. Um, as a disclaimer, some of the things that I'm going to uh, mention is the way I teach a baseline form to my archers. Um, you can disagree, and you're probably right. Um, there's more than one correct answer. Um, but more than thinking of, okay, it's my way and this is the way it's got to be done, a better way to think of that is um, consistency. Consistency and repeatability. Anytime you can get an archer to repeat a step the exact same way every time, they're going to be more consistent. Consistency and repeatability lead to accuracy. So it's more about re repeatability. You can have an archer that has horrible form, but as long as they have that ho same horrible form, every single time they're going to put the, put, the, put the arrows, they're going to make the adjustments and get them all in the middle. So um, a, a perfect uh, argument, or I should say basis for my argument is Matt Stetsman. And most of you probably know him. If you don't, um, you, need, you need to, the very next thing you watch on Netflix needs to be Phoenix Rising. Um, amazing documentary. Uh, they just created it last year. It's, it's, it's spine tingling. I think it made me cry. Uh, it's just amazing, and it, he's, he's one of the featured uh, para-athletes that they, they focus on, and it's just incredible. Um, good teaching moment for your kids. You should totally teach them. Um, there's just so many, there's so many ways you, places you can take his story. Uh, the one that I use is, uh, you know, we can debate on the proper way to hold the bow. I can bet none of you have ever taught any of your archers to shoot and hold the bow like that. So um, the reason he can do that is because he does it exactly the same way every time. So consistency is um, really pivotal for accuracy. Um, you know, he's a para-archer, but his goal is not to be the best para-archer. His goal is to be the best archer, period. And he beats a lot of uh, archers that have the disadvantage of having arms to shoot with. Okay, so going right into the steps, that's where I want to talk about these uh, shooter mistakes based on the steps. Some of these are pretty basic, especially here at the beginning, and most of you know these. Most of you probably gotten these, these from um, some of these sessions or 
already. But um, the number one thing that I see even my advanced archers doing is uh, they don't get their stance set until the whistle blows. Um, when you have them go up to the line, and especially if it's in a tournament or win it, whatever, they have anywhere from 30 to 60 seconds. Now that's 30 to 60 seconds that you know you have their they're in a conscious state of mind. They're not in that trance that they get in when they start shooting. So this is one step that they should be able to get 100% right every single time. So that's, what is it? I don't know, if you break down percentages wise, that's 9%, they're 9% there. So there's no reason they can't get this right, exactly right every time. So you gotta get as many of these steps exactly right. And by right, I mean repeatable. Uh, every time. So get, have them get their stance before the whistle, before the shoot whistle. Um, once they get their stance set, you know, I mean, I, it, um, it, they shouldn't move it. I tell my archers, that if you, in, in any of these steps or any of your instruction, if you can give them some sort of a visual, it just makes it click and it makes it memorable. I tell them, um, you can tell them, uh, open your stance and they'll go like this. Well, no, that's not really what I mean by open. By open, I mean this, but you know, so there's a little bit of a disconnect and confusion that can happen. So uh, for distance, you can say shoulder width, but you know, some kids have shoulders this wide, you know, so that doesn't really quite work. I like to tell them, if you could draw an imaginary line to your armpits, to your heels, you know, dotted line. Imagine this, this dotted line. That's, where, that's, that's the distance you need. Give or take, either direction is going to be fine. That doesn't matter as much as long as they're doing it the same way every time. Um, like to have them open them up. One of the things I can have them do is say, well, you can take a, uh, your, you know, your front, front toe and have it line up with, okay, maybe the second eyelet on your shoes um, or something like that that makes it repeatable every single time, which then brings up another um, esoteric, kind of silly thing that you can really make fun of me about, and I, I'm okay with that because I deserve to be made fun of. They should, shoot, they should have a pair of archery shoes. They should shoot with the same shoes every time. Um, it's a little thing. But I think more than, you know, than an actual physiological um, step, I think it's a mindset. When they put their archery shoes on, they know they're going to shoot archery. It's just like wearing a tie, you know. I'm wearing that power suit. I don't wear suits, by the way. I got that power suit on, it's a mindset. I got confidence, you know. Um, and I, I, I don't wear a tie unless you die. So um, the other thing about flat shoes, like Converse or Vans or anything like that, is it allows the metatarsals to spread out, gives you a bigger platform. You know, you can probably talk to a lot of really good archers, particularly if they're in, they're in the bare bow line of archers, um, that love to shoot barefooted. I mean, it's because the, the, the feet will spread out and it'll give you the biggest platform to shoot from. So really tight uh, athletic shoes sometimes will squeeze, you know, and uh, yeah, it could be debated, you know, and I, I, I wouldn't be able to argue it with a straight face, but, more than anything, it's a mindset. It's that kind of a mindset that if it starts when they put their shoes on and goes all the way to the, to the point where the whistle blows and they take the line, it's a hundred different little things in the mindset like that that can have a difference, you know, and that's probably where you're gonna get mileage from. Um, your, your, your archer's archery shoes should stink by the end of the year. So, because they're sweating in them. I had a, this is my daughter's feet, by the way, and she had a pair of really blinged up sequin stinky shoes but she loved them um, but they're flat you know so um, psychological thing more than anything else but if you're going to line up your stance you know and do all that thing it's just one of a hundred things that you can do to for repeatability once they get their they, they they should get their stance set before the whistle blows that's free time that's like that's like being in basketball and not taking any of your timeouts you know it's like yeah you're, you're not using your timeout. The timeouts are there for strate strategy and, you know, you're going to be better if you use those timeouts. Use that time before the shoot whistle goes to get their feet set. Once their feet are set, they should not never move them. They should be glued to the floor. You need to give them some kind of a visual like that. They stick to the floor. You don't move them. The reason is because if they make an adjustment on that first arrow and then they move their feet, well, you've introduced a new variable that's going to change any adjustments they make. You got to try to eliminate those variables. You want as many constants as possible. Getting their feet glued is a constant. So um, you need to have consistent placement every time. Knock. Uh, the, the, what I've chosen to talk about is really more of a, an equipment issue than anything else. But um, 
You want to have them get in the habit of checking uh, vein alignment to the knock placement so that the, um, the knock is lined up with the index vein. And you also want to have them, this might be something a lesser known, but these archers get good really fast and they tear the heck out of knocks. And if you see it like, I mean, obviously the first one you can tell it's damaged, but um, some archers will miss that even. And then they get up to the line, they got to raise their hand, yeah, I got a damaged arrow. Messes up their whole shot sequence. But uh, the one that doesn't get caught a lot is those little, these little burrs get on them, and that's anytime they hit them, if it's got a burr on it, you can still shoot it, but it's not going to shoot the same as the four other knocks that are brand new because it just takes a little bit to change that knock of, of hitting that to spread it just a little bit to make the knock tension a little bit different. You have um, having five arrows that have all the exact same knock, ten, knock tension is also key. I mean, that's, that, again, another esoteric thing, but it's one of 100 esoteric little things that can make a difference between a 295 and a 292, which could be the difference in $20,000 at nationals. So it seems like a little thing, but it's, you know, it's a, it's a big deal. Um, if it doesn't click, then usually they'll catch that, but you can even have them click when it's got a little burr like that, but the knock tension's different. The arrow will absolutely fly different if the knock tension, because when that arrow, if you've ever watched any slow motion, that arrow will slide down the string and then take off versus if it's got tight. Now it's fine if, if all four of them had the exact same loose knock tension, they're gonna, it's, they're gonna shoot the same, but, um, and that's all, another reason why I like to have my archers have their own tournament arrows that they only use in tournaments, but they shoot with them th the last practice before tournament. So they're dialed in on those arrows because knock tension can be different. Practice arrows, practice arrows have been shot, you know, 500 times, 600 times. They're gonna have different knock tension than a brand new arrow. Once again, it's kind of an esoteric thing, and I'm sorry, to, but it's it's something to pay attention to. Not necessarily for the beginner, but um, for your your top archers. Um, we always have tournament arrows for our whole team. We allow them, to, you know, encourage them to have their own. And that's fine, but we have tournament arrows that are tournament arrows, and then we have practice arrows, you know, and you don't want to intermingle the two, and so that way they can, you know, all have good, clean knocks. Um, and, of course, knock below the locator. Most of you know that. Some of them will put it above or whatever. But, um, and then probably something I see, I see a lot, and it's, it's difficult even as a coach, but your, your archers need to be able to be aware and maintain their own equipment from the standpoint of letting you know if there's something wrong with their, their bow. You know, we have archers, I don't know how they get to state and nationals, and they've got, they've got that plastic knock locator with the wax on it, you know, that will move, you know, which there's nothing wrong with going ahead and putting a knock above that and letting them shoot with it, but um, uh, just putting a knock locator above the wax one, and then they can shoot until you can remeasure and get to a different place. But um, so you definitely want to have one of those. You don't want to shoot with that factory knock. But the thing that you need to have them tell you about is the, and, and watch for is the wear of the serving string just below that knock locator. If they've been shooting, if it's, if it's the older sibling's bow and that, knock, that string hasn't been changed, I can guarantee you that, that that's crushed and it's real coarse and they may be able to knock it at a different point and you're gonna get some inconsistency. So I like to have, I encourage my archers to shoot, to bring their bow to me so I can change their bowstring at least every two years. Um, it's $35 to get it from Genesis. Um, I also tell them that, and I won't, I won't put on a string that it's bought from an archery shop. Not that they don't know what they're doing, but they don't have the same specs as Genesis. I want a Genesis string on there because I, I have had strings early on that, you know, and I bought it and it was at nationals and it was, pretty but that thing was wound so tight bow shot like shot horrible changed it back to a factory string shot fine you know and maybe it was a mental thing maybe not but just ever since then i've been just like you get a nat get it get it from genesis it's 35 bucks maybe a couple dollars more you can still get colors i think the colors are a little bit more always change the cable and the string don't change just if they i have them buy their own strings but a lot of times they'll buy just the string and not the cable i, I don't like putting the used cable on you know i want the whole th new if i'm going to go through the trouble of changing your bowstring that's fine but i want i want you to get both um, about every two years the strings themselves 
you could probably shoot them for 10 years and the strings themselves probably don't stretch that much. Not, not as much as these kids, even if they're shooting a lot, they're still not shooting a lot in the, in the grand scheme of what these strings can handle, but it's, it's the serving that, that wears. And you could say, well, they can just put a new serving on, but it, there's so many different weights of serving. If you take it to the bow shop or Bass Pro or whatever, they'll put a new serving on, it's not gonna be the same thickness of serving that, that Genesis puts on. So then you're gonna have too much knock tension or not enough knock tension. So just get the strings um, from Genesis. Okay, now we're getting into the good stuff. Uh, draw hand set. Um, most of you probably seen archers will they'll get their 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 finger a little too close to the to the uh, too much pressure on the knock and it'll cause the arrow to fly off. So then to combat that, what they'll do is they'll start putting a half inch below, and that's bad. You don't you don't want them to have because that's what that's technically what that's called is string walking and it's a method for aiming and it changes your aim point. Um, it's also because you don't have grooves or a way to get a consistent amount, you can get close, but you might be a little bit off if they go too far down. Now, technically, also because of the the, ang the angle with these um, the center to center on these these bows, the strings their their fingers going to go back up and put pressure on it. But um, I still like I don't want, I don't want them to go too far down. I tell them the way I tell them is you need to have a credit card thickness between the knock. In, the, uh, in your top finger. Um, I've had archers try to shoot off of their fingertips, so they won't go to their, um, they won't go to their archer's groove, they'll just go to their fingertips with the thinking being, well, it's, I can get a cleaner release if I just go to the fingertips. Absolutely not. Uh, it's, it's, that becomes a repeatability issue there, that you can have a much cleaner release by using the archer's groove. Um, so uh, archer's groove always. I have my archers, I, I encourage them, don't make it mandatory. You know, if they wanna shoot with their bare fingers, that's great. That's probably the more correct way. Um, that's not proper English, but um, it's better to, uh, you know, it's better if they do shoot with their fingers and if they can do that, that's fine. But if they're gonna use a glove, I always encourage them to shoot with a Damascus glove. Um, and you're gonna want, even if they're high school kids, have them shoot with, um, or have them order uh, the youth sizes, sizes. There's only one company that I've found that actually has the youth sizes, and, I, and I've looked everywhere. Um, if you order off Amazon or any other place and get this Damascus glove, um, it'll come in adult sizes and it'll be too big. It needs to be really tight, as tight as they can possibly stand it, um, because it's gonna stretch a little bit over time. Now you can see that it's a little bit slick. This Damascus glove is really thin, um, and you can get a good clean release. I think maybe even cleaner than you can with sweaty fingers, so, which is why I kind of, I, you know, I'm, I'm all about this glove. So uh, the first time I seen this glove, you know, because I'm like this, you know, uh, 10 years ago, or nine years ago, whatever, it was the first archer that ever shot a 300 out of Kentucky. I forget the guy's name. Um, but they, I seen a news article on him. And so I'm in there zooming in on the, like, what kind of glove is he wearing? Ah, oh, that's what it is. And I looked forever. I didn't know it was a Damascus glove at the time, but then I just kept looking until I found that glove. And that was the glove he used. And it's like, if it's good enough for a 300, it's good enough. And so then ever since then, that's the glove I've always recommended. And it does work good because you can pick that glove up and uh, within one shooting session, it feels broke in, you know. The really thick ones, you know, that they sell at Bass Pro, are terrible. They take, they take years to break in. The kids don't have any feel for it. Their fingers won't hurt, but the kids don't have any feel for it and it'll, it'll cause them to use much, too much pressure on the wrong fingers. And so it, it just, this one is the closest to shooting with, with bare fingers. And I would argue that it's better because you can see how slick that is. I've had archers that try to shoot with a, a golf glove or a baseball glove, those kinds of gloves, their purpose is for grip. They have a little bit of coarseness to them. Now, when you, you use a baseball glove or a golf glove for a long time, it will get slick. But usually, they just they start they start shredding, you know. And that's you, that that's to me that's things that's going to snag and uh, decrease. But at the same time, I've I've allowed my archers to shoot with them because they they kind of get stubborn and they want to shoot with that glove. It's like, well, okay, you know. So, um, but the Damascus glove. Uh, 
The only company that I found it, I don't know if I mentioned this or not, it's genesisoutlet.com. Um, that's not the name of their website because Genesis sent them a cease and desist letter about five years ago. So they had to change their name. It's Shipley's, that's what it is. I couldn't think of it the last hour. Uh, Shipley's Outlet is what, it's, what it is now. And they're the only ones that I've found that um, have the um, use sizes. So uh, they also recently put a diagram up there with, with measurements. But if you have a big team and you're really going to push this, you might just go ahead and order uh, three or four sizes and have them in your coach's box and let them try them on because every third person that orders orders the wrong size. So, and I end up having to buy them from them. And that's how I got a few of them is because I just, well, let me buy that from you because I need to have it. And so I end up with a whole bunch of them in my, so anyway, so uh, Shipley's Outlet, Damascus Glove, um, it's great. Um, and then probably the number one thing, and this is really easy to tell, if, if, they, if they complain that their, pinky or their third finger is hurting, or if you see their arrows porpoising, I used to think, well, I, you know, let me look at your bow. Maybe your knock is not in the right place. And uh, I, I would move it up a sixteenth of an inch, down a sixteenth of an inch. It's like, why, why is that, you know? And then just here in the last uh, few years, I finally figured out that, okay, what's causing that arrow to porpoise, and you can see it if you go up to the target, the arrows will be in like this in the, into the target. Um, and what causes that is they're putting too much pressure on this third finger. It causes it every, every time. So, and you can see it when they shoot, when they, when they draw back and you look at that triangle that's created from the cams, it, it'll be straight. If they're holding it right, it should, it should pivot and come back, almost like they're shooting with one finger. But rather than trying to have them shoot with one finger, which is, I seen a kid do it over there, and you, maybe you guys did too, it's pretty amazing. <laughs> Believe me, we've tried it, and that is hard. You know, that would take a lot of practice. I'm not saying it's not a good thing, but don't feel like you've got to try to have them do that. Just have them, just, have them just, just borrow 10% and 20% from these two fingers, and then they can get the same, almost the same benefit of shooting with one finger. Now you're still going to have a little bit of pull. So when they pull, they should be able to feel most all of that. You know, it's almost like they're shooting with one finger. They're holding 70% of that weight on that first finger. And that's, that's a big thing. It's a, it's a really big thing, but they have to be consistent about it. And that's a tough, it's one of the many things that's tough to change later on. <clears throat> Oops. Okay, bow hand set. Um, this is a really big one, and this is one that a lot of archers, new archers and experienced archers get wrong. Um, for some reason, you know, they all, they all know that they're not supposed to grip the bow. That one, everybody picks that one up. It's the, even if people don't know anything about shooting, oh, you're not supposed to grip the bow. Well, what happens is then people will they'll do this, and they get their fingers, so they'll almost go, go overcompensate for it. The way I like to teach it is... Um, with the lifeline, like you've, but I gotta, uh, you know, draw a lifeline on your hand or theirs. If uh, I'll draw it on mine, I teach high school kids, um, so I can draw on their hands. You probably wouldn't be good to be sending elementary kids home with sharpie on their hand, but um, you know, I'll draw on my hand and I'll show them. You know, this is this is how you got to do it. I want to go and I go down the line and check, make sure every archer's, every archer's that riser is only touching the pad, their thumb pad. Shouldn't touch any other part. That, um, that what that will prevent, number one, is string slap. So a lot of archers, new archers will want an arm guard. Well, you're just covering up a problem in the form. You know, they shouldn't need an arm guard. No, no NASP archer should need an arm guard. I, I say that, but I did have one archer that had some kind of a contorted, deformed elbow <laughs> that bent this way. You're like, I've never seen such a thing. You know, and then you got to get a little more creative with maybe a more open stance which, you know, um, just so that you can open it up so that, so that there's clearance. But 99.9% um, .9 of the archers, this will fix string, string slap. Um, this is also very, very critical. Um, the whole bow gripping thing, it's really, it's really important. There's two points that you're holding that bow with, and it's your anchor, and it's, it's, it's this. So you got to get these two things right. Um, there's two ways, two methods of thought, or two ways, two things that you can, you can see, that I, you know, have my archers shoot. I have some archers that will, that can do this well, um, and that's where there's no grip on the bow. It's completely relaxed. Their fingers are behind, 
and they keep their bow arm straight, and when they let go, the natural weight of the bow will allow it to rock back. It's very pretty. Um, when other archers, there's a team here in Missouri, Carl Junction, uh, you can watch their whole team. You know, I remember at Nationals watching their whole team, they were all shooting fairly close together, and you could just see every single one of them. They were all shooting with that exact same form, and it's like, that's amazing. I mean, I would love to be able to have a team that every single one of them would do that. Um, one of the things that that does, probably the biggest benefit, is not that it rocks back and it looks cool and makes them look like they know, know what they're doing, is that in order for them to get that feedback that that bow is rocking back, they got to keep that bow arm up. And dropping the bow arm is, is a huge mistake that so many archers, you know, particularly if you have an archer that um, they shoot four tens and they drop an eight. And it's six o'clock, eight. Guarantee you they drop their bow arm. It just almost always that's what it is. So um, it's, it's, a, it's a big mistake that they make. So having the bow rock back, in order for them to get that feedback of, yeah, I'm an awesome archer, look at how pretty this looks, they've got to, they've got to keep that bow arm up. I have my archers keep their bow arm up. I, you know, we do drills, and it's like I want to be able to look down the line, and I want to be able to see every bow. You know, we'll call out the commands. I want to see every bow on the line up because I'm just trying to make my archers look the same like Carl Junction. Um, <laughs> And it's like, I want to see every, every bow arm up for two seconds after the shot, you know. And it's difficult, even when I just told them to do that. And it's like, no, nope, I, I, maybe half of you. We're doing it again. We're going to do this until I see every archer for two seconds. You know, and that's one of the drills you start out with. Um, two seconds is a long time to expect, but you have to overcompensate because that two seconds will turn into 0.2 seconds when they get in the tournament. But um, the downside of having that beautiful balanced bow that rolls back and the bow arms up is they really get into that. So then they start making it happen. They start rocking with their wrists, then they start bending. That, if they start bending their arm, that is, that's almost hard, it's hard to fix or harder than target panic. It's so hard to fix. You know, you can try splints and everything else and you know, it's, it's really hard to correct. Um, our archery program has 160 kids and, you know, I like to try to find ways to have a baseline form that I can teach a large number of kids and trust that if they adopt this, then they're going to do fine and I can, I can move on to other things. So um, rather than having them do that and trying to stay on top of each one of them, rocking the bow and making sure they're not bending their arm because that's just as bad or worse than dropping their bow arm. So the way I have them my archers do it is I have them rest their hand and I have them take these two fingers and I have them put those two fingers on the front of the riser. Now what that does is it gives them a tactile message to the brain I'm not going to drop the bow. I've got a hold of this but there's no torquing that's going on. It's just the lightest possible touch on the front of that riser on those front on that little little cold metal part of the of the bow. Um, Because if they know they're not supposed to grip the bow and you can get them to not grip the bow, what a large majority of them will do is even if they're not doing this, if they don't have, they have, to have you know, a lot of them will have their hand open like this. When they say don't grip the bow, this is what they think, they think you mean. Well, then naturally they're going to go like this. That's worse. I'd rather, have them, I'd rather have them just grab that bow. You need death grip, whatever you want. I don't want to see you doing this. That's worse. That's way worse because there's definite movement there. And when you release, the, the, the brain wants to do things in the same. So when you release, you know, you get, they're going to do both. And then pretty soon they're going to be gripping and moving just a, just a split second before. Um, doesn't take much. So when they have that tactile feel of touching the bow, they don't have the urge to grip the bow on release. So it prevents that. So even if they hold like this, I've had archers that do have a nice relaxed hand but they'll still go like this. They'll still want to grip that bow. You know, and at what point does it become too soon? You may never notice it. Well, why are their scores going down? Or what, you know, they're not shooting. It's little, thing, it's little tiny things like that is what causes archers. And maybe, maybe their score only goes down a little bit. You know, it's little tiny things like that. This allows me to know that, okay, I, I don't have to worry about that. They've got that. But like I say, the only downside to this is then you've got you to gotta make sure they're not dropping the bow arm. So, pre-draw. Okay, so this is where the trouble happens. Um, how many people here have had an archer with target panic? 
Um, I take it that if you've not had an archer with target panic, you maybe have only been coaching for a year or two. Um, because, it, or, or you maybe don't have enough, you have a small enough group that you can stay on top of them. But if you have a larger group and you've been coaching for a couple of years, you're going to see it. And the thing is, is it's, it's so heartbreaking because it's going to be your, it's going to be your best archers. Um, it's going to be people that archery is so important to them. And there's a, there's a strong likelihood they'll quit. Here's where it starts. It starts at pre-draw. A lot of archers will go, they'll just skip this step right here. They'll get their bow hand set and they'll just, they'll draw. They'll draw while they're, while they're coming up. And that's, that's bad. It's really bad. You need to have it kind of come up uh, and be a distinct step. Uh, draw. Do not aim here. Do not aim here. You got to try to get them to think of something else so they're not thinking about aiming. This is where if they've been hold, if they've been aiming, if their brain thinks they've been aiming in the last two steps, this is where they lose it. And this is where they get to where they can only get to here. You get off from a hundred dollar bill. If they can get to their anchor and hold for a second, they will not be able to do it. If they have target panic, they just will not be able to do it. So they need to understand that they can't be aiming here. Um, don't let them, new archers, of course, will, you'll see where they draw faster. You know, maybe they got too much poundage on their bow or whatever, or they do the sky draw jerky or whatever. You know, so you tell them you want to have a nice smooth draw, smooth draw, but then what you'll see the flip side of that where they're overcompensating again and they're, they're drawing really slow. And that's worse. That's worse than a quick, fast, jerky draw because if, if it takes them two seconds to draw to anchor, that's, they're aiming. If, if they're drawing that slow, they're aiming, I promise you. Uh, and that's, 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 you know, that's, it's deathly to getting the target panic. So don't let them to draw too slow because that causes subconscious aiming, which then causes them to skip steps and then just go right to release before they even get to anchor. So archers need to have a continuous smooth level draw. Um, what you can do is have them focus on something else. Um, like have them visualize, think about where that, where the resistance is, is it, it's, it's in your hand, you know, think about keeping your arms straight or your, your hand straight. So that's one continuous thing. Think about, you know, you, you start with your, you do start with your hands, you know, the, the weight is with your arms, but then have them think about, visualize, see if you can feel that weight going to the back and then in, in your back shoulder mu muscle. Not that it's, I mean, naturally if they draw correctly and get set correctly, it's gonna happen, but if you can get them thinking about that, it can take their mind off of aiming at least uh, and, and give them something else. I did try this one year. I had, a, I had a coach when I got USA Archery certified. It was a great thing. It's like, oh, that's great. I'm gonna use that. And I don't know that it's a USA Archery thing or this person that was teaching the class just, but I, I experimented on my kids and we tried it for a year and it was pretty good. It really was pretty good. And it, we called it draw to a pledge. And it's where you, you draw out here. You gotta be careful cause you don't, you can derail the bow if, if, if you're not careful, you can put torque the bow if you're not careful, but you have them draw out here. So they're not looking straight down the arrow, you know, so have them kind of draw out here and we call it drawing to a pledge, you know, like you're pledging, but they took it too literal. So what they ended up, I had so many archers that were, going to here and then coming to here and I'm just going, oh, what have I done? You know, I've made, I have made a, a horrible mistake here by having him do that. However, nobody was aiming, you know, so I probably shouldn't even bring that up, but except, but except that that's kind of a strategy that maybe as a coach, you just have to kind of try to think of ways to do something a little bit different to give them something to visualize so that they're not looking down that arrow and aiming, you know, so you've got to have them, have them be focused on the steps and being conscious and not flipping over into that subconscious mode, aiming and then shot going off before they get to their anchor. So, and if you've ever watched any, if you get a chance to watch the Olympic recurve archers, that's, that is how they draw. They'll, they'll, they'll draw like this and then they'll bring it in. They won't bring that in until right at the end. Then they'll, then they'll bring it in right at the end. And that, that's what it does is it prevents them from subconsciously aiming. Um, Okay. Anchor. All right. So I have two steps here that have a critical arrow on them. This is critical. I think this is critical. This, I, you know, I did have a, 
a question in the last uh, class about, ah, I've got an archer that's plateauing. And, um, some of these little esoteric fine tuning things is the difference if you have an archer that's a 270 archer that just can't get up to 280 or have a 280 archer that just can't get up to 290 or whatever. Then you got to, they've got to be really disciplined and it's, it's exponential. You know, if, if they can get to 280 in one year, that doesn't mean that, that they should be immediately keep on going to 290. Those points are exponentially harder. You know, it can be, it can be two years after that first year that, until they get to the 290s. You know, I really think it takes about a total of two years. If everything goes right, it's a really disciplined archer. There, I don't think an archer can get to a 290 before two years of experience, you know, unless they're very disciplined and they have any, and, and or they have other experience, archer experience. So, but here's one of the things that, that I think that can really get the advanced archer up over that hump However, I say advanced archer, I think you should have your archers from the very beginning shooting with a triple anchor. Um, and I use the corner of the smile. The reason I use the corner of the smile for the number one anchor point is, you know, you can, you know, I've had archers use the, a canine, their canine, and that's great. If you can get them to do that and they're bare finger, they don't shoot with a glove, that's better. That's probably the best place to anchor because it's bone. Anytime you have bone on bone, it's, it's repeatable. Corner of the smile is not repeatable. However, the way I teach it, it's just one of three, so it's close enough. Um, I have a lot of archers with braces, and they don't, they don't even like to stick it in the corner of their smile. They, they, don't, they don't like it. They're just afraid. It's uncomfortable. It hurts. Uh, when they're afraid they're going to hurt it. Um, so if you just have them put it in the corner of their smile, um, has a baseline, um, that's good, but that's not enough. That NASP teaches just corner of the smile. And the first archery lesson, you don't want to go anything really more than that. But then very soon, you want to be introducing advanced ways to anchor, advanced ways to aim, advanced very soon. Because once they get that muscle memory and those neural pathways baked in, it's really hard to change. So corner of the smile, front, front tip of the nose. Not the back of the nose, not the very center of the nose. Now. This is baseline. That might not work with every archer. Every archer's face, facial anatomy and their hand size and all that, their nose shape, everything. And there's a lot of variables there. Sometimes it's hard. And you know, I, I have archers like, why can't they touch their nose? And I'm sitting there working. It's like, okay, well maybe the back corner of your nose. But if you can get them to touch the front corner of their nose, that's the best. It's the best for a couple of reasons. It's very repeatable. Um, it lines that string up with the center of the eye to the center of the target. So it gives you, even if, I'm, I'm, I'm talking about string blur and some other types of way to adjust left and right, even if they don't do that because it's, that's too hard for them or they're too new or whatever, they're gonna be dialed in almost 90% correct if they touch that string to the nose. Because, because um, one of the things that makes, like if you go to an NFA range or a USA archery range and you, you, you watch these, these $5,000 rigs that these people pull out of there, you know, they got stabilizers and peep sights and draw stops and clickers and pouches and all of these shooting aids that make them really accurate. Anything that you can introduce in your coaching that makes each step repeatable, like those shooting, age, sh shooting aids, then um, they're gonna be more accurate. Consistency, um, you know, Repeatability leads to consistency and it leads to accuracy. So um, having that string touch, the, touch that nose, that's just like having that peep sight that those bows, those, those freestyle bows, you know, they have that peep sight that they look through and they look through that peep sight and then they, then they, then they look through the, the sight and then, you know, some of them even have like magnifying glasses and stuff in there. That, so we don't have those things, so what can, you know, a good strategy is what can we do to mimic that? You know, like for, um, for a draw stop. And a lot of people will debate me on this, but um, for this bow, I'm a firm believer in locking the elbow um, because that's like a draw stop. Between this and this, that's a draw stop. You're getting to the exact same point every time. If there's a slight bend in the elbow, that's, that can change over time. It can change in between the shots. So 
I could be debated and, and I would tell you, okay, I'm probably wrong. Maybe it is better to bend it, but I prefer to have it locked. You know, that's the way I teach it. It's not something that I really push. You know, there's a lot of things like that that I won't really push archers on. I just kind of like to introduce a baseline form. Here's what I like. You know, they're going to develop their own things in the way they shoot on their own. So um, trying to, trying to uh, create um, things that allow each one of these shots, sequence, steps to be repeatable. Um, the third, and this is probably the most important, it's really critical, is anchoring behind, behind the ear. And it's not just really behind the ear, it's below the jaw. What I like to do is have my archers hold their hand out, okay, find a way to lock that thumb and be able to do it every time the same way. If you can do that every way the same way, okay, now you've got, we're starting to work on a, um, a, another form of consistency or repeatability. So take this knuckle and, this, and, your, and, and the uh, fingernails, what I like to do, and I can, I can, that little curve, that little curve I have right here, it just fits right nicely underneath my jaw. And I can feel a little pressure on my, uh, my fingernail and I can, get, I can get to the exact same, that's like a draw stop. Just like the nose and this, it's like a draw stop. The corner of the smile, that's not really a good draw stop. But what that corner of the smile will do is it'll allow the, it'll allow the hand to be straight and it's, it's just one more point of, of consistency. So um, you put enough pressure, try it. You can go ahead and try it and just put it like right where you, the corner of your jaw is, put a little pressure right there on the, on the corner of that jaw. It should feel, you wanna put enough pressure that it's just a little bit uncomfortable. Because when you get, if you get used to shooting that way, then that's, a, that's another one of those tactile feedbacks that sends a message to the brain, I'm in the right spot. I can feel that. Just like the, the, the tactile feel of the front of the bow riser. And this was a really big breakthrough that we had with, with some archers that, that really gets them into that next, that breaks, you know, gets them over that hump, gets them into that 281 or gets them to that 291. It's an, it's an accuracy thing. So... Two is great. You may only be able to get him to do two. Three is better. Uh, the kid over there in the other room, she, he had four. And I was like, well, never really thought about adding a fourth, but if three is good, more is better, you know? So it's kind of the American way. So um, the only thing I don't like about using the fletchings, I guess if I was going to maybe justify why I'm not teaching four, is that to get that fletching back, you, you, you're not getting it on the corner of the nose and you're almost getting close to an overdraw state. And I do have a lot of archers that will overdraw. And they get way back here, the bow goes here, and then they have trouble with their left to right adjustment. So, aim. Um, I kind of have an issue with aim being eight. I would rather aim be nine. I'd rather have shot set up in front of aim. Because once aim happens, the shot goes off. So, um, I even, for I think a couple of years when I would call off the drills and we didn't have the steps because I didn't, you know, uh, I didn't have the poster yet. Um, I did shot set up before aim because once, once aim happens, I mean, there's, there's, a, uh, there's a practice and then there's a reality and the reality is, is that um, once they get to aim, the shot is going off within a second to, uh, less or less, especially if they started aiming at pre-draw. So, um, um, as far as specifics of aiming, um, even my advanced archers, archers have been shooting with me for several years. I could go up to, you know, maybe they're having trouble or whatever. I so, said, well, where's your, where's your aim point? And they can't tell me where their aim point is. I don't know. I'm trying to find it. You should be able to tell me where your aim point is. You let an arrow go and you had to put that. You've got to be able to tell me where your, your aim point is. Um, one of the, the ways that we get our kids to, and this is a double-edged sword because aiming totally leads to target panic. Uh, we use golf tees, um, and we make them put golf tees on the targets um, because that does a couple things. It makes them think about their aim point. It's easy to change. It makes them think about, okay, I need to adjust my aim point. Um, aim points will change from shot session to shot session, and it could usually it's not much. It might be a half, but um, you, they need to understand that their, their aim point is not going to be the same way every time they shoot, it's gonna move. Right? Maybe their face swells, maybe it's humid, maybe, I don't know what, you know, maybe they're just anchoring just a slight bit different, but um, it gives them feedback of 
they need to be thinking about their aim point, but as a coach, you can walk behind and you can tell where their aim point is. You don't have to ask where their aim point's at. If their aim point is out at 2 or 3 o'clock, it's, it's not a 12 o'clock to 6 o'clock orientation, you've got an issue. Because you can have a kid tell you where the top of a circle is, but you might have, and, and you, they could go up to it and point it and hit it precisely with their fingertip 10 times in a row with 100% accuracy. If they're aiming off to the right and maybe it's, you know, 112 or some kind of an odd 112 and 30 seconds, you know, it, that's hard to repeat. If they need to make an adjustment, they're going to be hesitant to make an adjustment because they're not going to move up or down. They don't know how much to move up or down. They don't have, they don't have that clear frame of reference like a 12 o'clock to 6 o'clock gap shooting orientation. So they really need to be shooting at a 12 o'clock to 6 o'clock gap shooting orientation. Putting that string on the, on the nose will, for most archers, allow that to happen. If they're, if they're anchoring too deep, then that's one indication that they're anchoring too deep is their aim points out to the side. Um, so, so I've had some archers insist on using the little points and some of the marking or some of the, the shape of the riser for aim points, whether it be the top or um, that's a less preferred way of, of doing it. I don't like it because it's usually not a 12 to 6 orientation. They're having to aim off to the right somewhere and it's harder to make adjustments because their aim point changes all the time. So I like them to have use the, use the arrow tip, don't use the riser. Uh, that string to the nose, it'll allow you to have a 12 o'clock to 6 o'clock rotation or, I mean, uh, movement of, of, of aiming, of gap shooting. So uh, I know that new archers, you, you don't have to kind of get so much into the aiming point. In fact, you're better off to really downplay aiming for new archers. Um, just tell them to point the arrow, pick a spot, point the arrow the middle of the target. Uh, save that for a little bit later. Aiming takes aim, aiming is is also one of the really bad things that that causes target panic. F focusing too much on aiming. So, shot setup. Um, I wish this was before aiming, um, but I mean, technically, the shot setup is you know the squeezing of the of the back muscles i i've taught it i've taught it a little different i sort of broke the rules here i like to tell them shot setup because even your best archers it, it it's hard to get them to do some of, of the advanced things and it's really hard to get them to do this it, to you know do the the squeezing of the scapulas and stuff like that and, and the, once again practice versus reality i use this i use this to get them to adjust their string alignment left to right. Um, and it's probably, I definitely wouldn't argue that that m might be the wrong way to do it, but um, I like to have my archers um, use string blur to adjust left to right. Um, and the reason that I have them use string blur left to right is because, uh, or well, I should let me back up here. Um, as long as they're shooting with that string on their nose, they're going to be they're going to be within the yellow, um, from one side to the next. But and and coincidentally, you have about that much adjustment to get them to understand how to execute string string blur and string alignment. Is um, you can just have them take that string blur and find it, and then they'll say, "Okay, yeah, I see it." And it's blurry and it's fat. It'll be about the thickness of a um, a finger because I shouldn't even if I don't, it, it might be too close to the eye to even focus on, you know. But they're going to be focusing on their arrow tip and or the uh, the aim point on the target, so that string blur is going to be blurry. But it, you, they can see it enough that they can align that string blur with the side of the arrow, with the arrow rest, or maybe even further over. Or they can look around the string and put it on the other side of the arrow. And the way that string blur, moving that string blur left to right, what this does is it allows them to. Um, get their left to right adjustment. And like I said, I'm, I'm, I'm not correct in, in teaching it this way, but I like to have them do their shot setup and do their string blur and do this before the aiming step. You know, I tell them to do your string blur, check your string blur, aim, release. And that's the way I call out the steps. Um, now, 
left to right adjustment is easy. They should be able to get that dead on. There's no reason your archer should be missing left to right. If they're touching that string to their nose and they're doing the string blur, they should be able to get the left to right. But for some reason, almost all archers, they always focus on I'm high or low. Now, they may say I'm shooting left or right, but they're not doing anything to try to fix that. They don't know how to fix it. Most of them don't know how to fix it. So you need a, you need a naming method to, to fix that, and string blur is one of them. Uh, it's just like you're shooting a rifle. You know, I can take a rifle that's got open sights, has a front sight pin and a rear sight pin. In order for me to hit my target where I want the bullet to go, I need to line the front and the rear sight pin up. And that's the way you think about string blur. It's the same thing. So I can take a, a rifle and I can hold it sideways and I can put the arrow tip or arrow tip, uh, the rifle front sight pin on my target. But if I'm holding the rear sight pin way out here, the bullet's going to go that way. I mean, that's an extreme example. But um, when you have archers that are just putting the arrow tip where it needs to go, they're only doing 50% of the aiming process. They need to do left to right, too. So they need to be able to adjust that string blur left to right. Some kids can't get it. They just can't get string blur. So if they're struggling with string blur, what I have them do uh, is the sight window. Uh, and, and this is kind of why I like having shots set up before, and I'm kind of borrowing this to do something that I think is more productive with it, <laughs> and then have aiming be last, and then the shot goes off, is, you know, I'll have the riser. Like, okay, if you can't get string blur, look at where the riser is. Okay, put your, your arrow on your aim point. You got your arrow on your aim point. It's bottom of the six or bottom of the ten or wherever it's at. Okay, now where is your, where's your riser at, you know? And then they can take the riser and they can put the riser at the three o'clock spot on each individual ring or number. That's repeatable, that's easy, easily correctable on the fly during a tournament. And you know, they need to be able to do that on their own. They need to be able to make adjustments. It's, it's just like clicks on a scope or whatever, left to right and, and then up and down. But most, most archers, don't pay any attention to the left or right. They only pay attention to the up and down. So 50% of your accuracy is left to right. The other 50% is up and down. So string blur and using the riser, the sight window. And the reason I like to have aim after this is because I like to have them change their focal length. You know, focus on finding, trying to find your string alignment in, in your sight, sight window, then focus on your arrow tip and then the very last thing I want them to do is focus on the aim point, trying to keep them from focusing at the target because that's one of the things that makes the shot go off. And then release. Number one thing you'll see is they'll start plucking. Um, only way you can fix it is with a string bow. If they start plucking, you can tell them to quit plucking, but they can't fix it. They can't fix it unless they use a string bow. A bow. And it can't be a stretch band. It's got to be a string bow because you have that resistance and they can pull back. Now, um, our middle school, we have 100 kids on our middle school team for the last three years. Um, only way we can get 50 of those kids on the line, we can get 25 targets, 50 kids in line. I take 50 of them for 30 minutes. We go do, we go do stretch bands and string bow. It's really hard to keep 50, 50 middle school kids engaged um, for 30 minutes before they get to go shoot the real bow. Um, but the ones that do it first, they get the, that, war, that good warm up you know, versus shooting and then going to this. But um, the only way you can fix plucking is with a string bow. Uh, I like, and I like it for that. I prefer the stretch bands because it gives them a better feel on release. Um, it makes them feel like they're shooting something. Um, we did buy a set of um, Acubos, but I wouldn't recommend getting because they're really cheap and they break and they're, they're, they fall apart and the kids jack with them and it's, just, it's a mess. They can't hold on to them, they drop them, they break. So um, the stretch bands are great. Use the stretch bands. But have string bows too, because it's the only way you can fix um, plucking. Um, creeping forward where they start doing this, only way you can fix that is with the string bow. And they've got to do the, fall, the pull through. Static release won't work. You know, if they're, if they're creeping, they, they've got to change to a, to, to a, full, a pull through. They don't, and when you're teaching it and drilling it, it is, it is okay to have them over exaggerate it and have them put that thumb on the shoulder because they're not gonna keep it that way. They're gonna eventually go to something like this. It's a little more natural. Sometimes when you're doing drills, you have to over-exaggerate to get, to get that compromise of somewhere in the middle. Um, and that's, you know, that's the whole static release pull through 
release. Um, I don't know if I, I can't remember since I taught this just last class if I went over that or not. I have a lot of archers that will just do the static release where they just open up. If they're shooting well, I don't change it. Um, as long as they're shooting well and they're not creeping um, and they're getting a good clean release, I, I'll let that sleeping dog lie. Um, I did try to fix, I had an archer that was shooting great. It's like, the only thing you need to do is just do that pull through, you know, that really pretty pull through. Took forever, she finally got it, shot her worst high school score ever. That was a, a tournament in the morning, she shot a tournament in the afternoon. I said, we made a mistake, I should have never had you do that, I should have never had you change it, you weren't broke, we should have tried to fix it. Go back to your static release. She was back up into the 290s, so. Um, so it's one of those things where you gotta be careful. The best time to really try to do a, a correction, that's a massive, that's a massive thing, a pull through release versus static, that's a massive change on a good archer. The best time to do those kinds of changes are when they have target panic or they, they're, they're really struggling. Because then you can, you can give them one thing at a time and they're willing to listen. Um, a really good archer um, will not they're it's like, well, that makes it worse. I'm not, I'm not going back. I got this tournament. I got to shoot the score at this. I'm not changing it, you know. So, um, all right, I'm, I'm out of time, I think. But I, I really got to get, I got a nugget that I want to give you if you, if you can allow me. If you want to leave, you can go. But my, the best thing I got to give is a little bit after, after this. So the follow through reflect, um, you know, the follow through, that's debatable whether you want to let them do that or not. This is where the archer grows. They've got to be able to have self-reflection, and this is where the growth happens. They've got to be able, a plateaued archer will not, will not be self-diagnosing, not be reflecting on how the shot felt, things like that. So um, there's always room for improvement. So this is where the growth, and this is where getting that, that next step comes from, is that, that reflection. So um, I'm not giving that enough time, just like the archers do. They just go over that one. Um, but if you need to leave, uh, that, that's fine. But the nugget that I want to give you, I'll try to give it to you in two minutes if you're, if you're willing to stay. And this is the target panic portion of it. I told you how it starts. It starts from them going to subconscious state too soon, aiming too soon. That's what causes it. In order to fix it, um, three things need to happen. All right. Um, you have to have an understanding of what target panic is. The archer has to have an understanding. You have to talk about it. It's not a taboo, Lord Voldemort type of word. You've got to talk about it. They need to understand it. It's no different than uh, uh, any other kind of a sports related or ligament type of an injury. Um, the reason you have the football players do the warm ups is to prevent the injury. So they need to understand that you have target panic, you have a, the equivalent of a brain injury or any other sports injury. You cannot go back out there on the field and play. You wouldn't put a football player back out there on the field if they tore, if they tore uh, you know, an MCL or an ACL. No, they've got to rehab that before they can get back out there. They need clearance. And uh, target panic should be treated the same way. Absolutely no tournaments until it's completely rehabbed. They need to understand that, you know, because what happens, it, it's the best archers that get target panic. It's the ones that really care about the sport. They're trying really hard. We're in, we have this results-based society instead of, focusing on the form or just focus about the results and the scores and the numbers and, and then the anxiety and all these things, you know, and it compounds and then they, they have expectations that are high, their parents have expectations that are high, their teammates have expectations. It, it's very demoralizing. I had archers quit that I just adored. So um, <clears throat> and it wasn't until a couple years ago, that I, about two years ago, that I figured this out and it works. It totally works. And you can, you can see progress within a couple of practices getting archers through target panic, which may not sound like a big deal, but I've had archers that have had it for two years uh, and then just didn't come out for the third year. So under, three main parts to requirements to fixing target panic. You have to have an understanding. You have to define the cause and you know what it's going to be. Um, there are different, many different incarnations of target panic, but 99 times out of 10, they're not going to be getting to anchor. You, and you, you, you address it the same way with every archer. The third one is you have to rehab it. Um, so they start skipping, you guys know they all start skipping steps when they, that's what causes it. They're going to that, that subconscious, unconscious state too soon. So to fix it, we've gotta, we've gotta, we've gotta reprogram the brain. And to do, you gotta do that with some drills. Uh, 
and these drills are really easy. A lot of people have talked about it. A lot of people have talked about blank bail. Blank bail, I don't believe, works for target panic. They'll find a point to aim at. What I like to have my archers do, the, archer, the target is in front of the net. They're going to shoot into the net above. And, but if I had, had diagnosed an, an archer with target panic, they're not, they're not releasing. They're going to execute every step except for release. And they're going to do that for at least one whole practice. So they're going to get up on the shooting line. They're going to go through all the steps. Everybody else is shooting. They have a lane mate. They're shooting the same target. But what they're doing is instead of releasing, they're going to draw down. They're going to put that arrow upside down in the quiver. They're going to go through all five arrows. They shot. When they're done, they turn their arrows over so nobody gets poked. And then they go back to the line. So they've got to do that for at least one, one full practice. And then when they feel comfortable, you feel comfortable. OK, now they're ready, ready to progress to the the next protocol or next stage, and that's where they can, um, they can release their fifth arrow. The first four, they have to um, anchor and go through everything, just, and then the very last one, and you need to be there for this part of the rehab, they've got to be able to hold on anchor. Most of them will be able to hold on anchor. They're not shooting it at the target, they're shooting it into the net. It's the net. The target's what's, the target's what's making them want to aim too soon. They're not gonna, they won't let go. So then they get to work their way up to five arrows, progressively getting to shoot one more arrow at the end because having those first few arrows at the beginning of the process where they're shooting two, you know, three, two, one, until eventually they can shoot all five into the net. Um, and you can see progress within a couple of practices. Now it's so easy for them to re-injure themselves and go back, but you're having them shoot into the net. They need to shoot at least a couple of practices into the net before they ever go to that target. You know, and probably the quickest we've ever fixed uh, an archer is you know, three or four practices. But that is amazing if you've ever had to try to work through an archer through target panning. Like I said, sometimes it can last up to two years. So then after they get to where they're shooting well in the net, then you can progressively bring them down one arrow at a time into the target. So, and I've gone way over, six minutes over. So however, if the target panic's a big deal. I mean, it's a, it's a huge deal, and uh, it's really important. You can feel free to contact me if you want the longer Cliff Notes version of target panic, and I'd be happy to help you.